Thank you. Thank you, Shana. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, it's funny because I'm in Colorado. We have snow on the ground. A couple of days ago, we had about six inches, maybe a little more. <clears throat> the temperature is like 37. I've got the windows open. I mean, that's what I love about Colorado. Like people just do not understand. All the time, I, I, I'll, there'll be a picture of me on Facebook, maybe outside in the snow or something. People say it looks so cold. I know, like, actually, it's not. I mean, not that we don't have our cold days. And I think there might be a cold front that's forecasted to come through, but it's like, you know, they're actually minimal here. Um, it, the days are actually quite nice here. So it's lovely. I got the window open and enjoying the view and the fresh air and happy to see all of y'all. <clears throat> so we are gonna be starting today on quote 441 in the seven steps to awakening. Regis, is that beard new? I don't remember the beard. Yeah. Regis is trying to look like Santa Claus a little bit, it looks like. <laughs> Very nice, Regis. You look, you look, uh, you look different, but it looks nice. <clears throat> I was looking at her thinking, I don't remember a beard on that face. All right, so 441. What appears to be the world is the expansion of one's own notions or thoughts so very very brief short quote what appears to be the world is the expansion of one's own notions or thoughts and so uh i think what you all probably know happened when i was contemplating these quotes is that i was of course contemplating from my own spiritual Evolvement. Um, and so let's go look and see how I found myself contemplating quote number 441 by going into out of the stillness. So this is this is where this went for me. Where does a nighttime dream come from? And of course, the answer is the mind. How is this known? And the answer is from my experience. For example, I can say something that sticks in my mind and see something else on TV and the two become mixed up with one another and create a bizarre dream. What was in the mind shows up as a dream. And in fact, I'm just gonna stop there for a second. I've you know, marveled at the the dream process, the nighttime dream process, because there have been many times when I could remember the dream well enough that I could actually look at the different things that happened in my day or my week or my year and see how those things came together to create this dream. I could see it. But the dream was none of those things at the same time, even though those pieces came together. The dream was none of those things. It's like the mind can take what we have focused on and create something completely different out of it. But the mind can't create something um, unique, uh, spontaneous, something that has nothing to do with what we at some time have focused on. Isn't that interesting? It, it, it can take these different puzzle pieces and create a completely bizarre story. But there's never anything that arises in a dream that is fully different from something that we have focused our attention on at one point or another. So um, again, I'll read that last paragraph and we'll move forward. How is this known that the mind creates the dreams? From my experience, for example, I can say something that sticks in my mind and see something else on TV and the two become mixed up with one another and create a bizarre dream. What was in the mind shows up as a dream. Has there ever been a dream that appeared not to come from the mind? Yes. When I lived in North Carolina, 
I had a dream that told me to go to Puebla. Where did that dream come from? Intuition, I would say. Have there been other intuitive dreams? Yes, there have been a few. So two types of dreams are experienced, mind projection and intuitive projection. Yes. Where do both mind and intuition come from? I'm not sure. Both are experienced by the person self. Would you say the entire dreamscape is experienced within the person self? Yes. Is that known when you experience a me within the dream? No. It is known upon awakening. How does one awaken from the dream? It happens spontaneously. Does the world share characteristics with the dream? And the answer here is yes. And this is based on previous inquiries in the journal where we were looking at, we meaning me and inner wisdom, <laughs> where we were looking at uh, how the characteristics of a dream and the characteristics of, of what appears to be life are, are very, very similar. Uh, for example, I remember telling you all that, you know, for example, none of us remember the beginning of, of our lives. You never remember the beginning of a dream either, right? Uh, life is constantly changing. Dreams are constantly changing. But, you know, when I was investigating this earlier in my journal, you might remember this, I, I started to say, uh, but there are bizarre things that happen in a dream that don't happen in life. For example, in a dream, I can fly, you know, and I can't fly in life. But then, but then I remembered something that had recently happened was um, at, when I was cleaning house, you may remember the story when I was cleaning house upstairs, had an upstairs and a downstairs to the house. When I was cleaning the house upstairs. I saw on this one table, it was either a dime or a penny. Uh, and, and I just kind of noticed it because usually there wasn't a dime or a penny or any kind of money laying on that particular table. I didn't really think anything of it. I picked it up, I dusted, I sat it back down, but I happened to notice it. And then days later, uh, I was sitting downstairs meditating and I heard this thump on my chair arm and I opened my eyes and there was that dime or that penny as if it had fallen through the ceiling and landed on my chair and it was no longer up there on the table. And so when I remembered that, I had to say, you know, it's not true that bizarre things only happen in, in dreams. Sometimes bizarre things happen in what we call life too. So that you could say that defense that I was going to put up that, but yeah, but look, life is different because life is always logical and dreams aren't. That defense fell apart through that little dropping of the penny or what or dime. <laughs> I like the word dropping of the penny. <laughs> I think that's a saying, right? Um, so what's happening here is inner wisdom is asking me, it's just saying, so does the world share characteristics with a dream? And I'm saying yes, because we've already investigated this together. And so then inner wisdom says, is it possible then that world experiences are made up of mind projection and intuitive projection? And I say yes. So basically what's been happening in this inquiry so far is we've been looking at just nighttime dreams and through the questions that are arising from inner wisdom, I'm saying, you know, most of these dreams I know are mind projection. I, I don't know that because somebody told me. I know that because I have been able to see the pieces, this worry along with this thing that happened in this movie, along with this thing that somebody said, you know, along with this memory, I can see how it all came together and made the dream. So I know the dream is a mind projection. And then it went on to ask, well, have you had any dreams that maybe weren't mind projections? And that's when I started thinking about like times when I've gotten guidance in dreams where I knew it was guidance. Um, and I said, yeah, there, there have been a few times when I would say it wasn't a mind projection. It was the way intuition was reaching me. You know, it was reaching me through my dream. And, and that feels like that was a little different. And so now spirit is saying, okay, so you know this for a fact. 
You know that nighttime dreams are usually just mind projection, but occasionally it can come from, you know, what was called another source, intuition. And that's a little different. And you also know that when you're asleep, you don't typically know it's a dream, right? You only know that when you wake up. And you also know that the characteristics of the dream and the characteristics of life you know, there's a lot of characteristics there that have shared. We, we've already looked at that. We've already compared that. A lot of those characteristics are shared. So here's the question now. Do you know for certain that the world is a real object? Could it be that just as this quote says that you're contemplating, could it be that the world is also made up mostly of mind projection, but occasionally intuitive projection. Like, do you have any evidence at all to say, no, I'm certain it's absolutely real? And the answer is, you know, actually, I, I don't. I mean, I may have always thought it was real. The people around me may think it's real. But if we look at it in the way inner wisdom is guiding me to look at it now, comparing it to a dream in the way it's doing now, I, at least I can't say for certain. It is entirely possible that this is mostly mind projection and occasionally intu intuitive projection, um, but not at all something that's real, right? So again, the question was, is it possible then that world experiences are made up of mind projection and intuitive projection? And I say, yes. The next question, have both been experienced? And yes, both have been experienced. I said, several beliefs have been uncovered as just beliefs, not facts. And when they were released, their appearance vanished from the world. And, um, you know, again, I'm speaking from my own experience, but by this time I had already let go of the belief in betrayal, the belief in rejection, uh, the I am bad belief. I'm sure some others too, but those are primary beliefs that I had let go of. And what was interesting about letting go of these beliefs again is once I, I saw them as just thought that I had believed in, and not an actual object, an actual thing that exists. Um, I'd also let go of the belief in hate by this point. Uh, those things cease to exist in my world. And what I really mean by that is, <clears throat> you know, like when two friends of mine uh, got a divorce, uh, these friends were quite popular in the Course of Miracles community, and a lot of people knew them. And so some people were saying, oh, you know, she rejected him. And other people were saying, no, 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 he's rejecting her. I didn't see either. What I, the way I literally saw this is it was time for that relationship to end. You know, so rejection was not a part of my world. Um. So I knew that the way I experienced the world changes as my mind changes. I already knew that at this point, which isn't that even more proof that the world is just a mental projection. If I already have my own experience of it changing as, I, as the mind changed, my experience of the world also changed. <clears throat> but of course, I've also experienced lots of intuitive guidance. Right. I'm not, not going to go through any stories, but I've experienced lots of intuitive guidance, which didn't appear to be mind projection, you know, guidance that has led me from one place to another, from one task to another. Right. I mean, awakening together itself has come out of that guidance. So, again, have both been experienced? And I said, yes, both mind projection and intuitive projection have been experienced in what we call life. Several beliefs have been uncovered as just beliefs, not facts. And when they were released, their appearance vanished from the world. That shows their appearance in the world came from mental projection. And then experiences like this writing, right? The way these questions are arising, 
I'm not making up these questions. Do you think that I could make up a question that would lead me to see beyond the way I see? The questions are coming from something that's already beyond how I see. And it knows how to ask the right question for me to get me to look at things differently. So that can't be mind projection. The mind is going to be limited. Just like I said, when a, in a dream, you can't dream about something you haven't in some way known. I mean, sure, you can dream that you can fly and in real life you don't fly, but flying is not a completely new concept. You know about flying, birds fly, airplanes fly. You have probably, almost all of us at some time have thought about what it would be like to fly. Have you not? So you see, that was already in the mind. Yeah, George is going like this. It's funny, in my dreams, when I fly, I, I like pedal, like I'm pedaling a bicycle to get up high, and then I can just spread my wings and fly. But see, I pedal like I'm pedaling a bicycle. Isn't that something that's already known? Right? It's taking two skills, bicycle riding and flying, and putting them together. It's not creating something new. So when something that is beyond my mind, beyond my level of consciousness, comes in, like these questions, that's directing me to see beyond my level of consciousness, there's no way that's from the mind. In fact, the mind can only reflect the past, something that's already been experienced, something that's already been learned, something that's already been thought about. There's nothing new or unique in the mind, it, even though it can reconfigure those things in what appears to be new and unique ways. I remember noticing this when I watched um, Star Wars because all of those character, all those aliens that they create in Star Wars, if you look at them, you know, this one has a trunk like an elephant, right? This one has ears like a koala or whatever. I mean, you know, you can see that the mind, it can take these different things and put them together and appear to create something new, but it can't actually create something new. It can't go beyond itself. So these questions that are coming in right now are from something beyond mind which I call intuition. So again, and then experiences like this writing and other writings, like the teachings of inner Ramana, the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the New Testament, etc., seem to be projections of intuitive knowing. Because when I, when I wrote down NTI, NTI was not my current level of consciousness. I was not writing what I knew. I was writing beyond what I knew. I was literally the first student of NTI. How could I do that? Right? It, there has to be something beyond mind that can also project into the world. So I said, does it, so, no, so inner wisdom then says, doesn't this also show that the characteristics of the dream of a dream and the world are the same? And I said, yes, I see that. You know, I can see that just like a nighttime dream has mental projection in it, a daytime dream has mental projection in it. In fact, if you watch, you know, you've heard the saying, history repeats itself. If you watch the world um, with enough detachment, you can see that all of the current events have happened somewhere before different characters, slightly different story, right? But it's just like all these things from the past are being reconfigured into what appears to be a new and unique situation, but actually it's not, right? These things have all happened before in one way or one form. So this, this, the way the world cycles itself is just like a dream. It takes all these same limited things and puts them together in a different way to create what appears to be a new situation, but it isn't a new situation, not if you really know how to look at it. So what 441 is all about, let's look at the quote again. The quote says, 
what appears to be the world is the expansion of one's notions or thoughts. So what this inquiry was leading me through was looking at this and saying, honestly, that appears to be true. I can, instead of just believing the world is not real, I can see how it definitely could be true that the world is nothing more than the projection of thoughts and intuition. Just like a nighttime dream is a projection of thoughts and sometimes intuition. So that's all that really happened there. You know, just getting me to a point of agreeing. This is a definite actual possibility. And that is 441. So that takes us to 443 is the next one I have highlighted. 443 says, oh, and this is a, I told you all, I think a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember if it was in a recorded, a recorded um, session or not, because we had a couple that weren't recorded. It says creation has not taken place. It is but an appearance like a mirage. And remember, I told you all that I was walking my dog and listening to the Tao teaching and listening to the word creation, creation, creation. And um, and I kept hearing this, no, no, no. And then I looked up and I suddenly saw for the first time that there's no such thing as creation. There has never, ever, ever, ever been creation. All there is, is, and there's not really a word to complete the sentence, but, um, you know, people would say God or the Tao or some people would say this or, you know, whatever. But nothing new has ever been created. You know, it's just it's just. This and that's all that there is. And it was amazing for me to look up and see for the first time because I had read it, you know, in, in this book. That there's no such thing as creation, but I had never seen it. So here's one of those quotes where it's being said, creation has not taken place. It is but an appearance like the mirage. So let's see where I contemplated this, you know, many, many years ago, because of course this scene only happened a few weeks ago. So here's number 443, and this is um, the inner wisdom asking me, is there reasonable logic to this flow of questioning? And I said, yes, it is reasonable. And then it's asking, the questioning may continue? And I said, yes. So apparently there might have been some resistance there or something that day where inner wisdom had to ask me permission to go even further, right? <laughs> but you guys, probably not hard to imagine that there might have been some res resistance. But I gave the permission. So then inner wisdom says, in a nighttime dream was a world created. And I said, no, no, a world appeared, but it was not created. Right. Isn't that true? When you dream and, and this entire scene is there, is that a creation or an appearance? Wouldn't a creation be something real, a real object that was made out of something else? Or made by something else? Was there anything real about that dream? Or was it just a temporary appearance that appeared and then vanished? Right? So again, remember the quote says, listen to how brilliant the questioning is. The quote says, creation has not taken place. It is but an appearance like the mirage. And then with my permission for the questioning to continue, and her wisdom says, in a nighttime dream was a world created. See, it's meeting me at my level and then making me look and contemplate in a way that I have never looked or contemplated before. In a nighttime dream was a world created. No, I'd never thought about that before. No, there was no creation in the nighttime dream. A world appeared, but it was not created. Why do you say that? 
because the things that appeared to exist did not exist. If something seemed to happen, it did not happen. It was just a dream. I didn't fly. <laughs> I was laying in bed asleep, right? Nothing was created. The questioning said, goes on. It has been seen that the world shares characteristics with the dream. Do you agree? And I said, yes, I have seen that the world shares many characteristics with a dream. In fact, the scene that occurs with questioning sees that the body world experience cannot be clearly distinguished from a dream. So what I'm saying here is basically, when I am sitting here in this contemplation and this inquiry is happening, it's extremely clear that there's no way I can verify that the world is real. Now, when I get up and walk away from this question, I might forget and start acting like the world is real again, right? But when I'm sitting here and this inquiry is coming into the mind and, and, and having me look in the way that's having me look, I, it looks pretty clear that that's a definite possibility <laughs> the world is not real. You know, I've seen that the world shares many characteristics with a dream. In fact, the seeing that occurs with questioning sees that the body world experience cannot be clearly distinguished from a dream. The next question, if both the world and a dream are made in the same way, which is through projection, is creation present in the world? Now, this is an interesting question because Inner wisdom just say, is just saying if, right? If, based on everything that you're seeing, if you know a nighttime dream is not creation, you know that. And you know that life and, um, and a nighttime dream share many characteristics. Is it possible that none of this has been created too? Is it possible that nothing has ever actually been created? Is it just possible, right? That's what it's asking. If both the world and a dream are made in the same way, which is through projection, is creation present in the world? And I said, no, neither the projection of mind or intuition could be called creation if the characteristics are the same as a dream each would have to be called appearance. So again, I'm just admitting to possibilities. But I'm, I'm admitting to possibilities with a, with a higher logic that has me seen in a way that I have never seen before. <laughs> this is the next sentence. You are resisting this. Is that true? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the next question. What is the cause of the resistance? Despite seeing this clearly, when this reasonable logic is followed, I am unwilling to state fully that the world is an appearance like a dream. Listen to that. I'm unwilling. I'm not ready. I just, I'm not ready to let go of the world as real. And, you know, we'll see where this goes, but you know, if I let go of the world as real, do you know what else I have to let go of as real? Me. That's the real problem. It's not the world. It's the me. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to do that yet. <laughs> this is where this is going. <clears throat> Are you completely unwilling? No, I'm not completely unwilling because I do see what this questioning points to and I cannot deny that. So there is a, there is a crack in it. There's an opening there, just not this full-blown willingness, right? Again, so the questioning may continue. Yes, my willingness is greater than my unwillingness. I give the questioning permission to continue at a pace 
that is perfect for additional scene. Notice I put a qualifier on there. I'm basically saying, please don't scare the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's do this at a pace that I can handle if you don't mind. <laughs> so I give the questioning permission to continue at a pace that is perfect for additional scene. However, I don't want to move so fast that I am scared away from this investigation. I don't want to be so scared that I close the book and stop and walk away and forget the spiritual path. Isn't that amazing that you can ask for such things? Yes, I want to continue, but oof, let's continue at a pace I can, I can breathe a little bit along the way, shall we? <laughs> yeah. So let's go on to uh, 445. That's what I have highlighted next. Four forty-five in the Seven Steps to Awakening says, "All these worlds, etc., come into being and cease to be as notions and nothing more. Consciousness does not undergo any change in all of these. In consciousness, there is no experience of pleasure or pain, nor does a notion arise in it as." This I am. So here the word consciousness is really referring to the absolute, right? So what I would call the first principle of God, right? And it's saying, even with all of this appearance, there is no change at the level of source. In fact, the source has never declared even this I am, right? This I am is the second principle of God. So the source has never changed at all. All right, let's see how I contemplated that. Uh, I have a 445A and a 445B. So starting with 445A. What have you learned through this investigation? Existence is here. This is one thing I've learned. This is a true statement. Existence is here. It is present. It is. It never changes. It is always present without change, even as the world and body experience enormous flux and change. And I've talked to you all about that game that I played for probably at least a year, whereas things would change with the body hungry and full, sick and well, hot and cold, et cetera, et cetera, that I would keep checking what has not changed. What is changeless? Even while all these things seem to be changing, what's the same? What's the same? What's the same? And by by doing that, I got very much in touch with what we call awareness. What I like to sometimes call isness. And I saw that isness is here. It is present. It never changes. It's always the same no matter what's going on with the body. Also, no matter what's going on with the mind, whatever the story of the day is. So that was 445A, just reminding me that I am aware of a changeless nature that could be called I, right? Then 445B, what is the cause of local experience of I am this person or I see from this body mind. Because of course, if we go back to the quote, remember the quote said, <clears throat> all these worlds, et cetera, come into being and cease to be as notions and nothing more. And then it's, it said, consciousness does not undergo any change in all of these. Well, 445A was looking at that part of the quote and reminding me that I am aware of a changeless nature. But then the second part of the quote says, in consciousness, there is no experience of pleasure or pain, nor does a notion arise in it as this I am. So the second part of the quote is what 445B is contemplating. So what is the cause of the local experience of I am this person or I see from this body mind? Inner wisdom is asking me to look at that. What's the cause of that idea? And I said, attachment to this person, body, mind is what I am, 
is the cause of local experience. And we just saw that I was attached to it because I had resistance to the questioning, right? Because I didn't want to let go of me. So clearly there's an attachment here. Now, uh, inner wisdom is saying, look at what is known. Is I am this a part of what is known? Now, the word known is in italics if you have the book. And that means that it was emphasized. So the first thing that had to be looked at is what did that word known mean? And if you remember the last time I was here, uh, what the questioning was having me look at was the fact that I do not directly experience the world. I only experience the world through the body. And then it had me look at, I don't even directly experience the body. I only experience the body through the mind. And then it had me start looking for, so what is directly experienced? What is directly experienced that is not experienced through something else, like a body or a mind or even an idea? And the only thing I could find that was directly experienced was what we often call awareness or isness. That's what's known. The rest of it isn't known directly. Therefore, it isn't known. If you see something through a distorting image, you're not, you can't say you know that thing because it's distorted through the thing you're looking through. So I can't say I know the world if it's experienced through the body and the body is experienced through the mind and the mind is clearly a distorting, a distorting image. I can't say I know any of that stuff because the only way to look out is through the mind and the mind is distorting. The only thing I can say that I know is awareness or isness because that's prior to the mind. So look at what is known. Is I am this a part of what is known? And the answer is no. It is not a part of what is known. It, meaning I am this, is not direct experience. Right? I am this is not direct experience. In other words, the correct answer, I didn't answer the first question correctly because I hadn't looked deep enough yet. But the first question was, what is the cause of local experience of I am this person or I see from this body mind? The answer really should have been thought. Right. But I, I hadn't looked at it that way yet. So I didn't give that answer. So another question came to cause me to look at it differently. And to see that answer that I am this is not a direct experience. Look at what is known. Is I am this a part of what is known? No. It is not a part of what is known. It is not a direct experience. Only being is directly experienced. There is a thought that being occurs through the body mind, but I can only find that as a thought. I don't find any direct experience that verifies that. And then and then um, inner wisdom said, stay fixed on what is known. Do not be swayed from knowledge. Um, we're gonna continue, I think, because we still have time. First of all, my heart, it, just in rereading this, my heart is like beating. Um, And the reason my heart is beating is because, you know, even now I know that I could not have asked myself those questions at that state of mind, at that state of consciousness. So I know that something helped me. 
And I think I want to pause with just that, even before we go on with whatever comes next. I want to pause with just that because I don't think everyone realizes that we can't awaken on our own volition. In other words, I think some people think we awaken on our own volition and, and, and somehow I have to do this, right? But there's no way I could have done this. So it's important just to accept that. Again, it, it goes back to what I said on Sunday about, you know, Jesus said, um, for this, for, for, for man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we have to tune into that, whatever the word God points to, right? We have to tune into that. We have to get in touch with that. If we're interested in awakening, I mean, you don't have to do anything. But we can't do it on our own. We can't read enough books, listen to enough teachers, figure it out with the mind, and get it. We have to put ourselves in a position, which for me is contemplation in the early morning hours. Your position might be slightly different. But we have to put ourselves in a position where we are open to this wisdom coming to us from beyond us to shift our seeing and our thinking in whatever way our seeing and our thinking needs to shift now. And if we never take the time to put ourselves in this position, uh, uh, I don't know, I, it feel, that feels like treading water to me instead of swimming. That's what that feels like, treading water instead of swimming. When we go into our devotional time, we don't have to know what's going to happen. In fact, it's better if we don't. You know, maybe you're in a particular course of study, like you're doing gentle healing or you're doing MPP and, and, or 500 days. And that, if so, that's great because those things are set up not to teach you intellectually, but to lead you to contemplate and allow these questions to arise and allow you to be guided from within, even though it appears like you're going through an external curriculum, right? That's how those things are designed. So they're all helpful. But if you don't have that, you know, when I sit down in the morning now, I'm not going through any curriculum. I will just feel to pick up my notebook or to pick up a particular book, maybe open it to a particular place. I mean, I will just feel, and I have no idea where this is taking me, but by the end of that time, every day, I know what I got out of it. The point is, I, I have that time set aside nearly every day. Don't get me wrong. There are some days where life just takes off and I don't get to it but nearly every day. And somebody was asking me this morning, because you know, last year at this time, I was doing it like eight hours a day. She said, I heard you're not doing that anymore. I said, that's true. I said, it's changed. Here's what's happening now. What's happening now, and by next week, who knows, it may change again. But what's happening now is I'm feeling guided Monday through Friday uh, to go in the morning and meditate with Anne and Rhoda and whoever else shows up in the sanctuary. That's 7.30 Eastern time, 5.30 my time. So I start with that hour. And then after that, I go into uh, an hour and a half. And oftentimes it actually stretches out to two hours on its own, <laughs> but an hour and a half of contemplation. And then I go walk LA and my day starts, starts, you know? But do you know that for nearly 20 years, because I consciously started the, the spiritual path in April of 2004. Look where we are now, 2024. For nearly 20 years, nearly every morning, I've done that. I've done that in one form or another, whether I was doing the Course in Miracles workbook at the time or scribing in TI at the time or contemplating the seven steps at the time or, but every day almost there have been a few handfuls of days where life went on without but as a very general rule nearly every day 
I've set that time aside. And if I was to give credit to anything for the shifts that have occurred here, it would be just putting myself in that position so that this inner wisdom could show up and take me where I needed to go today. I think that's the most important thing. I mean, you know, the most important thing of all. All the rest of this stuff is just gravy. So I guess I would say, I hope you all are doing that, you know, for your own sakes, of course. Yeah. And don't worry about where you're at. Right, Tina? Don't worry about where you're at. Just where you're at, meet inner wisdom there, and it will take you further. So that takes us to um, 446. Four forty six says, "There is the unreal experience of this world and what is known as the other world, though all these are false." So, you know what this says to me is, although it's not real, you do experience it. But isn't that true of a nighttime dream too? Right? <laughs> Something doesn't have to be real to be experienced. How many of y'all have been scared to death in a nighttime dream? right? Embarrassed to death in a nighttime dream. You ever been naked at your school locker before? I know I have been <laughs> at the school locker, getting my books. I look down, I'm naked. That's embarrassing. Right? You know, so we, we experience that fear. We experience that embarrassment and yet it's not real. So experience is not a criteria for defining reality. Imagine that. Have any of y'all ever in, in life, not in a nighttime dream, but in life, have you ever imagined that maybe somebody was in your house or maybe somebody was following you or something like that? And did you experience fear? And yet there wasn't anybody there. Right? It doesn't have to be real to be experienced. You can experience the fear of somebody in your house when there's nobody in your house. So experience is not a criteria for determining reality. That's amazing. So again, quote 446 says, there is the unreal experience of this world and what is known as the other world though all these are false. Now, I'm not real sure what he means by the other world, but I think he means like heaven and hell realms. Even heaven and hell realms can be experienced, but that doesn't make them real. Because experience is not a criteria for reality. You know, a lot of people take these near-death experiences. Do you hear the word experience in that? these near-death experiences, and they think what people have experienced is real because it was after what we call death. But this is saying, no, 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 you can experience the unreal. <laughs> Doesn't make it real. And you all know it's true because you've all experienced nighttime dreams and you've all experienced imaginary robbers or somebody following you or whatever, right? So there is the unreal experience of this world and what is known as the other world, though all these are false. All right, let's see where the contemplation went with this one. Number 446 and out of the stillness. Uh, it's all italicized, which means it was all emphasized, every word. All projection is unreal. Projection of mind is unreal. Intuitive projection is unreal also, although it points to truth. That's, you know, that's, that's amazing. Because at some point we all think 
that intuitive projection is real. For example, if we believe Gary Renard, I don't know if you do or not, and I don't care, but if you believe Gary Renard and you believe in art and in Persa, most people would think art and in Persa were real spiritual masters. This is saying even intuitive projection, even two masters who show up on your sofa to set and teach you forgiveness and, you know, they're not real either. They point to truth, but they're not real. And if you think about it, that has to be true or else all of this logic is false. Because if I do not directly experience the world, I experience it through the body, which I experience through the mind. Where are Art and Persa? On my sofa? Aren't they in the world? So aren't they being experienced through the body and through the mind and therefore not the one direct experience? And didn't awareness or existence exist before Art and Persa showed up? exist while art and Persa appear to be there and continue to exist when art and Persa are nothing but a memory? You see, what this is really pointing to, again, is you can experience all kinds of things. Some of those things can be very wrong-minded. Some of those things can be very right-minded. But they're all just appearance. None of them are the one reality. That's amazing, don't you think? You know, if, if you can understand even this one point, that can eliminate so much confusion on the spiritual path. Because one of the places where we as spiritual students get confused is looking at right-minded objects, for lack of a better word, you know, whether it be a descended master or a book, or a teacher, you know, an enlightened teacher or whatever, even in some cases people, you know, give certain vortexes in Sedona, I mean, <laughs> whatever, you know, and we think those things are truth and we get confused by those things for a time. We actually get distracted by thinking they're truth instead of just taking what they have to offer, but realize that's just an intuitive projection in the dream. That's not the reality they point to. They may be the fingers pointing, but they aren't what they point to. And it wasn't it Buddha that said that about himself, I think. He was just the finger pointing, right? And we get so confused. We think all these things. I'll tell you guys something. <sighs> Hopefully I'm not talking about anybody in the room. If I am, I apologize. I don't even remember who it was clearly. Um, but I've taken people to Israel three times. And... Um, there was something that pained me each time, caused me pain. We went to Israel to contemplate. You know, just to contemplate. And, and we did some good contemplation. I remember, you know, the discussions we had about what must it have been like to be Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when you could see the guys coming for you carrying the torches. Because we're sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see that you could see them coming. You know, you're sitting there. You know he saw them coming. He didn't have some intuitive feeling they were coming. He could see them coming, right? So we're contemplating what it's like to be Jesus this fear and, and, and the absolute devotion or love of truth that it took to transcend the fear and say, not my will, thy will, right? We, you know, we had some, did some good contemplation and I really love that part. But what also happened was we would go to places where they, you know, the tour guide would say, well, you know, this happened here and, I, and people would start touching the walls and going, oh my God, I feel the energy of Jesus being here. And I hated that stuff. I was sorry that I brought people to a place where they were doing that because I knew that wasn't real, right? See, this is where we get messed up on the spiritual path. We 
we lose our discernment of what's real and what's not real. And what this is saying is keep that discernment. Even when uh, an intuitive projection comes in, maybe as an enlightened master, whatever, you know, your own inner questioning, whatever. Listen to it, follow it, but don't believe it. It's just an appearance. It's not the truth, right? Listen to it, follow it, but don't idolize it. Don't worship it. Don't put your hand on the walls and feel the energy. There's no friggin' energy there, but your own mind projection. Because truth has nothing to do with this world, right? It has nothing to do with this world. So again, this says, all projection is unreal. Projection of mind is unreal. Intuitive projection is unreal also, although it points to truth. So another important point here, you know, how inner wisdom will show up for you uh, or does show up for you, I can't say. You know, it showed up for Helen Shuckman as Jesus. It could show up as Jesus too for you. It showed up at one point for me as inner Ramana, right? Ramana Maharshi. We listen to it. We totally follow its guidance. But remember, that's just the dream, the way the intuition is projecting in the dream. That's not Jesus. Listen to it as if it was. That's okay. But it's not. Jesus is the name of a human man that died. He's dead. He's been dead for 2,000 years. But the same intuition that spoke to him is now speaking to you as him. The same intuition that led him to his enlightenment is leading you. And it may show up as him just because that's something you're going to listen to. And that's great. But don't get overly confused that it's real. Because when we get overly confused that the unreal is real, we're distracting ourselves from reality. Okay, is that clear? And with that, I think I'll stop where it's a couple minutes early, but I'm certainly not going to start anything new. So it's great being here with y'all. And as far as I know, I will be here next week and we'll continue. I'll see you then. Bye.